I'm broadcasting uh, to you uh, from the city of Detroit. And uh, our topic uh, this evening uh, is one uh, that has gained a lot of national as well as international attention, and that is, of course, uh, the so-called Ebola virus disease crisis, uh, which uh, over the last uh, several months has garnered a lot of international attention uh, here in the United States as well as internationally. Uh, for uh, Workers World newspaper, I have written uh, two articles that have been published uh, over the last uh, several weeks uh, trying uh, to uh, examine the political impact uh, of uh, the Ebola crisis in Africa as well as its impact on U.S.-Africa relations. As uh, many of you know uh, who read uh, Workers World newspaper on a regular basis, uh, the United States is heavily involved in militarizing the African continent. At present, uh, there is the United States Africa Command, uh, which has thousands of Pentagon troops uh, that are being coordinated uh, throughout the African continent uh, from both Stuttgart, Germany, as well as Camp Le Monet in the Horn of African nation of Djibouti. We also know uh, that the United States has been heavily involved in many so-called counterinsurgency operations on the African continent. Somalia is an excellent example. Uh, we published uh, articles on the ongoing conflicts inside of Somalia. Also, the current situation in Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, also published articles uh, related uh, to the counterinsurgency operations against the Boko Haram uh, sect in the northeast of Nigeria. Uh, the United States is providing uh, not only uh, military advisors, but also they are involved in joint military operations, uh, training exercises, indeed control and coordination of uh, key uh, African uh, military forces. The African mission uh, uh, in Somalia, uh, as well as the uh, counterinsurgency against Boko Haram in Nigeria. Therefore, uh, we have to examine the deployment of, um, or the announced deployment of some 3,000 uh, United States Pentagon troops uh, to uh, several West African states that have been the uh, ones that have been hit uh, by uh, the Ebola virus disease. Uh, this disease uh, has uh, been recorded since 1976. Uh, it was largely confined in previous uh, years and decades uh, to Central Africa, uh, mainly uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo as well as Uganda. Uh, this is the first major outbreak, uh, although it's the largest outbreak, uh, but it's the first major outbreak in West Africa. And it has impacted uh, primarily three countries, Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Uh, all of these states uh, we will describe as neo-colonial states. Uh, Liberia, of course, uh, has its origins uh, actually through the uh, Atlantic slave trade, chattel slavery in the United States where many uh, former slaves uh, migrated uh, back to Africa, uh, to Liberia, beginning uh, as early uh, as uh, the 1820s. Uh, also in Sierra Leone, a similar uh, situation created that country uh, by the British, uh, beginning in the um, latter part of the 18th century and then of course uh, escalating in the 19th century. Uh, the uh, West African nation of Guinea uh, is a former French colony, and um, it was one of the few countries uh, in West Africa within the uh, French colonial system that broke with imperialism in 1958 under the uh, Democratic Party of Guinea that was headed by Ahmed uh, Secretary Ray. This just gives you a little uh, brief information about the uh, political dynamics and the history of these three countries that are involved and this international uh, pandemic. Now, I just wanted to mention that in the first article, uh, I started out uh, noting that eight experts and journalists uh, who were visiting the West African state of Guinea were found dead uh, in the village of Nzirakori. Uh, this happened on September the 20th. Now, they went there ostensibly to educate uh, people about preventing the spread of the Ebola virus and uh, the delegation uh, met purportedly with some community elders, and then they were attacked uh, by a group of youth. 
Now, Guinea was the first country, as I said before, that was identified uh, in the latest spread of the disease, uh, which previously had struck Central Africa, uh, as well as West Africa over the last three decades. Now, although the motives for the killing uh, of these eight um, um, health healthcare uh, specialists and uh, journalists are still not clear, uh, some people speculate uh, that the team uh, may have been killed because of suspicions that they were there not necessarily to treat people for the disease, but to spread the disease. There's a tremendous amount of mistrust uh, that has developed over the last several years uh, involving uh, Western medicine, Western medical teams, and several uh, African states. Uh, this these, uh, mis this uh, factor of mistrust and suspicion is not without warrant. Uh, many of us know of the uh, history of uh, medical experimentation uh, on African people during slavery, during colonialism. We know about the systematic denial and uh, underdevelopment of African uh, medical service treatment uh, uh, modalities. Uh, we know that uh, the legacy of slavery and colonialism, and, in, and indeed neocolonialism, has underdeveloped Africa and therefore prevented it from uh, developing its proper medical infrastructure, i.e., uh, creating enough medical doctors and physicians, creating um, medical researchers, uh, creating uh, hospitals and clinics, uh, and other uh, medical facilities, uh, medical education, and preventive medicine. This is a byproduct of the impact of imperialism in Africa. So we have to uh, acknowledge that the development of the Ebola virus disease outbreak is not taking place in a vacuum. It's taking place within a historical and social context. And of course, the United States and the other Western industrialized uh, imperialist countries are probably involved even today uh, in the attempted control and underdevelopment of Africa. Now, the mistrust that surrounds the, uh, the spread of Ebola in some West African states has impacted uh, the epidemic. Uh, there have been uh, leading newspaper articles. Uh, there have been rumors that say that the outbreak uh, is a direct result of biological warfare uh, waged by imperialist countries against the African continent. Now, I haven't found any concrete um that uh, would document that, uh, but it is something that uh, people do need to consider. And there have been articles written uh, over the last uh, several weeks that suggest this. I want to point out, as I did in the first article, uh, the Liberian Daily Observer. It's the largest, uh, most widely circulated newspaper in Liberia. Uh, Dr. Cyril Broderick, uh, who was a former plant uh, pathology professor at the university uh, in uh, Liberia, asserted uh, that the disease uh, is spreading in Africa and it stems from the U.S. Department of Defense's biowarfare against the continent. Now, Broderick article uh, stated that, um, quote, Africa must not regulate the continent to become the locality for disposal of hazardous chemicals, dangerous drugs, and biological agents of emerging diseases. He went on to say that there is urgent need for affirmative action in protecting the less affluent of the poor countries, especially African citizens, whose countries are not as scientifically and industrially endowed as the United States and most Western countries. Sources of most viral and bacterial are genetically modified organisms that are strategically designed as biological weapons. It is most disturbing that the United States government has been operating a viral hemorrhagic fever bioterrorism research laboratory in Sierra Leone, unquote. Now, this is a very serious allegation that's being made uh, by uh, this um, uh, professor of uh, biological science. He also says, quote, it is time to terminate them. If any other sites exist, it is advisable to follow the delayed but essential step. Sierra Leone closed the U.S. bioweapons lab and stopped Tulane University from further testing, unquote. Now, Broderick also criticized, he was criticized heavily uh, by the Western um, 
uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry and the media uh, that supports them, uh, would say that, quote, that such an inflammatory piece of writing is irresponsible since so many Africans, quote, already distrust Western medicine. Quote, they see Western medicine as the answer to Africa's deadly disease such as Ebola, while Dr. Bodrick sees it as the cause. He states, quote, African people are not ignorant and gullible as is being implicated, unquote. So there's some controversy around this. And as I said, um, with the uh, phase of this disease um, being noticed, the latest uh, massive outbreak in March, uh, so we're talking about uh, over the last seven months uh, that this uh, uh, outbreak has been spreading. And apparently, uh, the international community, including uh, the African Union and the economic community of West African states, have by no means uh, moved rapidly enough uh, in response uh, to this outbreak. Now, as we mentioned before, the United States Africa Command uh, is intensifying its presence uh, on the continent. President Barack Obama on September the 16th announced that the United States would deploy 3,000 troops to the affected West African states to combat the disease. He said that, quote, the United States will leverage the unique capabilities of the U.S. military and broader uninformed services to help bring the epidemic under control. These efforts will entail command and control logistics, expertise, training, and engineering support, unquote. And this is according to a White House press statement. Now, we know uh, that uh, what is needed uh, by all of these countries right now is trained physicians, uh, nurses, other healthcare workers, uh, medical researchers, the construction of uh, field hospitals, uh, the deployment of medications, uh, protective gear. This needs to be um, uh, shipped in uh, to the tune of hundreds of thousands. And yet, even according to the corporate media, uh, the response on the part of the United States, the Western imperialist countries, the pharmaceutical uh, and healthcare industries has been extremely slow, if not stagnant. Now, in contrasting uh, the uh, response of the United States and the Western imperialist states uh, to this crisis, we have to look at the role of revolutionary Cuba, which has a long history of solidarity uh, with the African continent, not just from a political or military standpoint, but also from a medical standpoint. As we know, uh, Cuba, uh, through the Latin American School of Medicine, even students from oppressed communities here in the United States. In fact, here in Detroit, uh, we have several students who are studying medicine at the Latin American School of Medicine. Uh, there's an organization here, a coalition called Doctors for Detroit, where we actively recruit uh, young people from the city of Detroit uh, so they can obtain scholarships uh, to study in Cuba. And this is done uh, as part of the overall international um, uh, proletarian solidarity that Cuba uh, has uh, been involved in uh, for over uh, 55 years. Now, I just wanted to quote uh, from the Vice Minister of Foreign Relations, uh, Alberlado Marino, and he told the United Nations Security Council emergency session on Ebola, on September the 18th that, quote, Cuba's response is part of our solidarity with Africa, Asia and Latin America, and the Caribbean. Over the last 55 years, he says, we have collaborated in more than 158 countries with 325,710 healthcare workers. Some 76,744 collaborators have worked in 39 African countries. Today in this sector, 4,048 Cubans are serving in 32 African nations, 2,269 uh, 2, of whom are doctors, unquote. And that's taken from Grandma International on September the 19th. So this is a profound uh, statement of solidarity uh, from uh, the Republic of Cuba. And instead of uh, empowering Cuba even more, 
or following the pattern uh, that has been set uh, by Cuba uh, over the decades, uh, this is not being uh, replicated uh, by the United States or by the Western imperialist countries. Now, France 24, uh, which is a uh, publication uh, that comes out of uh, Paris, uh, did write an article uh, very uh, commendable of the role of Cuba uh, in response uh, to uh, the Ebola disease uh, crisis. So these are some of the developments that have been going on. Uh, I also wanted to mention as well uh, that um, this uh, epidemic has impacted not only uh, Africa, but it's also going to have an impact on the United States as well. Uh, we have a burgeoning um, West African expatriate community here in the United States, uh, in the New York area. Uh, there are many um, Africans from Liberia, as well as Guinea, uh, who, are, uh, who reside uh, in the metropolitan New York area. And uh, with the diagnosis of at least one case of a um, Liberian American uh, who had recently traveled uh, from uh, his home country in West Africa uh, back to Dallas and um, has been diagnosed as being the first case uh, here in the United States. I mean, there have been other, other health care workers that have been evacuated, uh, American health care workers uh, have been evacuated uh, from West Africa to the United States for treatment. Uh, but this is the first one of a resident or a citizen of the United States uh, who came down with the disease uh, here on U.S. soil. And uh, what is going to be the response uh, of the, the state, uh, of the private sector in regard uh, to this phenomenon? I was reported earlier um, on um, October the 2nd uh, that some 80 people were being observed uh, in the Dallas area who purportedly had contact uh, with uh, this uh, young man who uh, is diagnosed as having Ebola. Uh, also, uh, there was uh, an article that was just published uh, in uh, CNN on, also on uh, October the 2nd, uh, which indicates that uh, the apartment in which uh, he was living, uh, his name is Thomas Eric Duncan, uh, they, uh, they, it's saying on CNN, that the quarantine partner of Ebola patient Thomas Eric Duncan should be moved with her family out of the Texas apartment where Duncan became sick with the virus and where his sweat-stained sheets were still on the bed, the Dallas County Director of Homeland Security said. But well, you can see uh, where the direction of this article uh, is going. Now we have to think about, uh, for example, uh, some uh, three decades ago uh, when the uh, HIV AIDS uh, pandemic uh, first became uh, a major news story uh, after 1983. And uh, there was a lot of uh, misinformation about the disease, about how the disease was transmitted. And I'm sure we're going to see similar uh, uh, scenarios uh, today. Uh, there were right wing organizations uh, uh, back uh, during the 1980s that were advocating a total quarantine or isolation of uh, people who were HIV positive or who had uh, acquired immune deficiency uh, syndrome. We may, uh, hopefully we won't, uh, see similar calls uh, here in the United States. Uh, we know that in Sierra Leone, uh, the government had placed um, uh, at least uh, a million people on lockdown uh, two weeks ago. And there are people who are saying, that this is not the best method uh, to approach uh, the treatment uh, of this disease. Now, I just wanted to, in closing, I uh, wanted to uh, mention uh, that um, as at, at present, uh, there are over 3,100 people who have been reportedly, uh, have reportedly died as a result of the Ebola virus disease. And more than twice that many, uh, approaching 7,000 from the latest figures I've seen, uh, from the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control uh, who have uh, contracted disease. Uh, now, whether these are documented cases or whether they are um, uh, uh, cases that are based upon statistical analysis, uh, it still uh, illustrates that the disease is spreading uh, rather uh, rapidly. Uh, there have been two other countries outside of uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia that have um, reported cases. Uh, Senegal, which is also in West Africa, had one reported case, 
and they say that the person uh, had recovered. In Nigeria, uh, there was a case of at least one death um, by a man named Patrick Sawyer, who was a Liberian, who traveled uh, from um, uh, Liberia to Nigeria in order to get medical treatment, and he died in, in Nigeria. Um, the president of Nigeria, Vidlock Jonathan, said last week that they had eradicated Ebola in Nigeria. So <clears throat> these developments are also relevant to what's going on in the other three states. Also, there were uh, uh, cases reported in the Northern Democratic Republic of Congo, which they're claiming are uh, the, the strain of the Ebola virus is different than the one that has hit people uh, in uh, West Africa. Although some writers, at least one writer, claim uh, that it is similar uh, to a strain that had been seen earlier in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which raises questions about uh, how the disease uh, broke out uh, in these regions and uh, also uh, why it spread so rapidly uh, over uh, these three different uh, countries across their territories. Now, uh, the U.S.-based Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, they sounded the alarm uh, last week, uh, saying that if the outbreak was not seriously addressed, uh, there could be up to 1.4 million cases by early 2015. Now, we don't know, uh, you know whether that's just based on um, um, efforts to uh, get more attention uh, to the disease, or whether it is probable, statistically probable, uh, for uh, 1.4 million people to contract this disease in a matter of months. Now, um, on September 29th, uh, the Associated Press even wrote an article which said that the needs of the outbreak have continually outstripped projections. The World Health Organization says around 1,500 treatment beds have been built or are in the works, but that still leaves a gap of more than 2,100 beds. So a lot of people are being turned away uh, there have been articles about Sierra Leone. They've been turned away from clinics and hospitals because there are not enough beds. So there needs to be the construction of, of field clinics and hospitals. Between 1,000 and 2,000 international health care workers are needed, and they uh, and local doctors and nurses will require millions of disposable protective suits to stay safe. Thousands of home hygiene kits are also being flown in to help families protect themselves at home, unquote. That's from the Associated Press. Now, um, what's interesting about this whole situation, though, is, and it's quite interesting that it was, this was published in a Washington Post blog on September the 28th uh, by a writer, uh, Karen Atia. She said that no African physician infected with Ebola had been evacuated for treatment to the United States. Now, this is a, a, a very, very strong statement uh, coming and being published in the Washington Post. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, there have been several uh, US-based uh, healthcare workers, uh, medical missionaries, who have uh, contracted the disease or have been exposed to it and have been evacuated immediately back to the United States. And all of them have responded positively uh, to treatment. But uh, Karen Atia is saying that there's some form of medical apartheid that is operating in this whole scenario. She says, uh, however, several white medical personnel were immediately sent back to the U.S. She points this out as well for treatment and all have recovered. Now, Atia stressed that the West African states are already suffering from medical personnel shortages. The deaths and sicknesses of some leading physicians in Sierra Leone and Liberia are worsening the overall crisis. So we have physicians uh, who have gotten ill, some have died, and some have been forced uh, into quarantine. She points out, and I quote, very recently, Dr. Olivet Buck, a Sierra Leone doctor, died after the World Health Organization denied a request that she be transported to Germany for treatment, unquote, wrote it here. Now, this is a very damning allegation. I mean, if this is true, uh, then the German government uh, needs to answer, uh, or other governments need to answer, uh, why uh, this leading physician in Sierra Leone was denied uh, uh, the right to be evacuated uh, for treatment. Um, she also goes on to say in July, Dr. Sheikh Kumar Khan, an eminent physician who headed up Sierra Leone's Ebola response, died after negotiations for his evacuation, unquote. 
Complaints have already been leveled against Western institutional responses to the crisis. Uh, this same blog, uh, written by Karen Atiyah, says, and I quote, the U.S. Agency for International Development came under fire briefly after it was reported at the field hospital it was setting up in Monrovia, Liberia, the capital, was intended to treat only foreign workers. The agency now says that the facility will treat health workers of all nationalities, unquote. So this is also a very serious allegation that the U.S. aid uh, would uh, talk about setting up a field hospital only to treat foreign workers and not to treat indigenous uh, Africans uh, right there on the continent who need more help than anyone else. She also says that, quote, on Sunday, September the 28th, health officials reported the Liberia's chief medical officer, Dr. Bernice T. Don, has been placed under quarantine after her assistant died from Ebola on Thursday. Sierra Leone officials have criticized the World Health Organization for its sluggishness on decisions to evacuate their country's infected doctors, unquote. A teal call for the rejection of travel bans and other forms of isolation regarding impacting, impacted West African states. She noted that, quote, health workers must be provided with adequate protective gear. We cannot allow what she called medical apartheid to characterize the international treatment of the African medical personnel and health workers from Europe or the United States, unquote. This writer then rightly points out that, quote, after all, the African doctors will be the ones to be on the front lines to help their countries against malaria, against child mortality, against malnutrition, and other diseases that threaten African nations, but not the foreign workers. The African doctors fighting Ebola are heroes, uh, Atia continued, just as much as any foreign volunteers. We cannot leave them behind to die, unquote. Now, even the Wall Street Journal admitted in a September 29th article that the American military effort against this deadliest Ebola outbreak is taking shape in West Africa, but concerns are mounting that the pace isn't fast enough to check a virus that is spreading at a terrifying rate, unquote. It also says that um, they're not moving fast enough. So there is an international mobilization that's needed both in Africa, but it also may become true right here in the United States. Uh, their efforts are put in place uh, to engage and uh, unwarranted and unnecessary quarantines, isolation, stigmatization of uh, African immigrant communities and others who may be suspected of uh, uh, being, have being exposed to the Ebola uh, virus disease. So I think that uh, this is something that the uh, party should definitely be concerned about. Um, I'm um, uh, very uh, pleased that uh, we have published uh, two articles over the last several weeks on this crisis, trying to place it uh, within a broader uh, socioeconomic context, uh, looking at the actual history of Africa, the political economy of Africa, the role of imperialism and the underdevelopment of Africa, and also uh, the threats of racism uh, and xenophobia, uh, both in Africa as well as here in the United States and in other countries. So this is something we should uh, clearly uh, follow. Uh, it uh, may uh, develop into a, a broad political struggle here in this country, and we know already that the African continent is very concerned. It's a major source of concern for the African Union as well as other organizations on the continent. So I will conclude uh, there, and um, we uh, will, of course, uh, continue to follow uh, this situation, and uh, of course, uh, we will uh, intervene and have an impact uh, on trying to develop solutions and also uh, political uh, programs uh, to address uh, this crisis. Thank you once again.